Hey everyone, welcome to the first video for section 9.3. So in this section, what we're trying to do is take our analysis of our linear autonomous systems, namely our matrix ones, and convert that into something we can use to study nonlinear autonomous systems, this random function that we're talking about here. And it turns out the main assumption we need is that our function system is local, what's called locally linear. So in this video, we're going to go through what that assumption is and why we need it to sort of set up to solve the problems and sort of motivate why it's what we need and why it works. Let's go ahead and just jump right into it. So chapter 7 was all about analyzing the, mat the constant coefficient matrix version of this autonomous system. So we already know how to analyze x vector prime equals a times x, where a is a constant matrix. And this depends on the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of a. Now our goal is to extend this sort of logic to, to nonlinear systems, nonlinear autonomous systems. And the idea is that if, if I can write this, this system as something like a matrix times x plus something small, then the solution to the nonlinear equation should look like the solution to the linear equation, which we know what that is already. So the first point we want to make is that if we make small changes in A, then we make small changes in the solution. So the first point is that small changes in A. So this could be like you're off by a little bit on what you put in for the A. It should be something a little different. Small changes in A give rise to small changes in eigenvalues and eigenvectors. What that means is if we're close to the matrix A we should be at, then in the linear case at least, then we're only getting a small change in eigenvalues and eigenvectors, so it's not going to affect our solution too much. Which means this little g term that it's small enough shouldn't really affect our solution too much. It should be pretty close as long as we're nearby to this sort of a point. Now there are two main problems with this, and these are centers and repeated roots. Now why do these guys cause problems? Well one way to look about it is look at it with our trace determinant plane idea. So if I draw my little plane here, Here's my curve, which is t squared over 4. Where do I get centers? Well, I only get centers along this line here. So if I have a point that is on this line that is a center, and I nudge it to a nearby eigenvalue, then I'm going to be somewhere nearby this. But if I'm to the left of the center line, I am stable. If I'm to the right, I'm unstable. And the stability just depends on which way I get nudged, which is going to be random depending on how I change my matrix A. So from centers, we could get stable or unstable. They are, however, all going to be spirals because the, the area above the curve is all just spirals. So we're going to get a spiral out of if we, if we nudge a center, but it could be stable or unstable. For the repeated roots case, if I start on the line here, I'm going to end up somewhere nearby. If I, if I nudge A a little bit, I end up somewhere nearby. Now this in this case, I'm going to get the same stability as the repeated root, but I could get spirals or nodes. Same stability as the repeated root, but it could get spirals or nodes. Depending on which way you nudge it, you're going to get either spirals or nodes. So these two end up being our issues that we'll come to, and you'll see if you look at the table in the back of the section when you were talking about the sort of theorem that comes from this, these are the two issues, the centers and the repeated roots that end up causing things where things can change when you go from the linear to the nonlinear system. So how can we use this? We're going to want to start near critical points. So we're going to assume that x0 is a critical point for the system x prime equals f of x. If we set u equals x minus x0, then I can shift this so my critical point for u is at the origin. So I, if I look at u prime equals f of u plus x0, then when u is 0, I have a critical point. Now the assumption we need to make here is that in this case, our equation turns into u is au plus some function g of u, where a is some constant coefficient matrix and g is small, where a is a constant coefficient matrix, and g is small in the sense that the size of g of u in terms of vector norm over the size of u 
goes to zero as u goes to zero to somehow like a second order term and determinant of a is non-zero so there's a lot of assumptions here and if we can do this we call this system locally linear so locally linear means if near every critical point i can write it in this form now it may look like this is pretty nasty trying to be able to prove that you can do this but it turns out that for most things we consider for most nice enough functions it's really easy to show you can do this and that's the, what we're going to start with the next video is starting with if I have a nice enough function, my system is nice enough, how can I show that it's always locally linear? It goes down to the same thing where you did before for calc 1 and calc 2, calc 3, when you do sort of like tangent line approximations, where my function is smooth enough, then the tangent line is a good approximation nearby. This is sort of the idea we have here where this is going to be that our sort of, some matrix we're going to generate is going to be a good enough approximation to our system nearby. All right, so that's it for this one. Um, I just wanted to go through sort of what the definition of local linear was and how we're going to try to use it to analyze nonlinear systems. Because if we can do this, we want to say that if we can solve the constant coefficient system, then we get an idea of what the nonlinear one looks like near that point. And that's what we're going to talk about more in the next video. So thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.